everybody, welcome back. It's such a quiet room today uh, for engineering management. And today's lecture is a continuation, actually, of last week's, which was a continuation of the week before, which was a continuation. But long story short, we're still working on lecture number five, if I remember this correctly. And uh, lecture number five of the Management of Information Technology series started out with supply chain management, which I think we covered a little bit of already. And I believe I stopped around here-ish from last time without getting into ERP. So I'm going to pick up with the ERP information from this point forward. So enterprise resource planning is a term used to refer to systems that link individual applications together. For example, accounting, manufacturing applications, um, or um, any type of sales or customer service, or any type of application at all within the company. So it's a single application that integrates data and business processes of the entire business. And here's a big old picture of what one of these things look like. Actually, there's no picture of what an ERP system would look like, actually. But it's software and hardware. Well, it's mostly a system. Uh, but we have manufacturing, warehousing, planning, accounting, distribution, human resources, engineering, all these different things that um, all come together in one centralized system. So you could possibly imagine why these types of systems are difficult to configure and why it's difficult to implement one as well. Uh, because it involves all of these different activities and if it does that then, you know, everything has to be adjusted to work with the system which takes a lot of coordination and it takes a lot of um, facilitation of, of transferring of data and processes and things in order to get everything into one centralized location which may or may not necessarily prove to be effective for the organization and you won't know until you actually do that so there's a lot of business re process, process re-engineering and a lot of things that go into the, um, the build of this so where did this all start out with? It started out with materials requirements planning so ERP system grows out of that functionality of MRP, which nobody really talks about materials requirements planning. They usually talk about enterprise resource planning instead. Um, it's a more updated term. So it's used to allocate resources for manufacturing operation. So big manufacturing houses generally focus in this area um, because it helps them actually do more and accomplish more uh, given limited number of resources and manpower. Um, so materials... Um, Resource planning itself ultimately became very complex, allowing inefficiencies and inefficiencies of scale not previously possible. So even more sophisticated MRP systems became to replace MRP systems um, in 19, around 1980s, around to 1990s. Enterprise activities were incorporated into the ERP systems. So about the 80s or so, it was materials resource planning. From about the 90s forward, it's enterprise resource planning in terms of its terminology. So today it encompasses, but it is not limited to the following functions. So we're typical to see sales and order entry in an ERP system. Raw materials, inventory, purchasing, production, scheduling, and even shipping, counting, human resources, as mentioned before, and resource and production planning, also part of the part of the um, part of the, of the growth of these systems. Um, so some major vendors in the area, SAP, obviously, Oracle, PeopleSoft, merged with Oracle. Toyota uses PeopleSoft and SAP, actually. Um, Microsoft Dynamics, formerly Microsoft Business Solutions. I don't know if they're still around, actually. Are they? Okay, good. So the slide set's about two, year, about two and a half years old or so. so. It's hard to tell. Companies come and companies go, so it's really hard to tell who is still in business these days. Uh, so e-business, also part of ERP. So an e-business must also keep track of its processes and all of the information associated with its accounting and all of the sales and marketing. And Basically, there's a tremendous amount of information that's stored for e-commerce. So businesses that, that have realized that much of the information needed to run the e-business, the stock levels, the warehouses, the manufacturing effort, the cost of the parts, projected shipping, shipping dates and stuff, uh, it could already be found in an ERP system database, so why not use the database instead of having to reduplicate all of that? So we're seeing a lot of convergence with the efforts of e-commerce as well as the traditional business practices mixed in with the ERP systems. Um, so major online efforts and many e-businesses evolved from adding web services to the existing systems. So if you don't have the existing system, it's really hard to build in that direction and you're not going to buy the system just because you want to do e-commerce. Uh, but if you have the system, 
it's already in place, then building e-commerce from it um, is relatively easy compared to building it from scratch. So. And what I mean by building the system is building the portals, connection to the database. Our second topic for to today is going to be on the concept of database technology and data warehousing and data mining, uh, which is our topic we're leading into. And if you already have that in place, it's so much easier to piggyback on those technologies than it is to implement it from scratch or put it in. But it, if you don't have it, it's hard to, it's, it's a real big project actually to put everybody on an ERP system or even connect them to a database. Uh, so many e-businesses, they want the same thing from their business infrastructure. So rather than build a custom application, many companies prefer prepackaged ERP systems as well. Uh, more efficient, less expensive. So the cost of implementing an ERP system goes above and beyond just the cost of the software. It's the cost that you have to build into the business process re-engineering as well. Because uh, you can't just take it, plop it down, and everybody start using it. You got data you have to put into it, transfer data into it, you have people you have to train on it, um, pro business processes, departments that have to sort of change to adapt to it. So most of the, most businesses need extensive help from consultants, so it's a big area uh, for people to work in. Uh, help not only with the install, but also the configuration, and then moving over the existing business practices over to use the ERP system, um, and then the changes that need to be made. It's like, um, well, it's sort of like how people, um, you know, um, adapt to technology in different ways. Like, for example, the invention of the word processor versus the typewriter. It's not only a condition of changing equipment, but using a word <coughs> processor is a lot different. You know, spell checker, grammar checker, and this, the applications of software, the computer systems are different. Um, is it both accomplishing the same task as the typewriter? Yeah, it certainly is. But uh, it's done differently. So a lot of people at the beginning took the, actually it's kind of funny, in the beginning, back before we had computers, when we had typewriters, people used to take typing courses. In the colleges, you used to have typing classes and learn how to type. Nobody really is about how, worried about how to type anymore, do they? So I never see any typing classes anymore. So. Well, we don't have any careers of typist. It's not about speed anymore either because that was old. That old technology, we worried about the speed of typing something and then not making corrections. You had to be a good typist so you didn't make errors because correcting an error was impossible or, you know, it was very difficult. Now we don't care. We just make the errors and we let word process or spell checkers check everything for us. So we'll change your business process. So the process of mutual adaption is called the system integration to adapt it, to integrate it. And consultants who supervise the integration process are often referred to as systems integrators. So that's where the systems integrators and mutual ad ad adoption actually comes into place. Outsourcing your ERP system. One response to the challenge of managing a complex system is just outsource it. It's kind of like outsourcing your supply chain or outsourcing your sales leads, you know, like salesforce.com for your Salesforce automation. Um, it's all cloud-based these days. Really easy to outsource that. Some businesses choose to outsource not only the installation, but also the ERP system software itself, and or go prepackaged, where you're using a system like it's like, kind of like going to Fry's and buying a system, but you're going to a consulting company who's building an ERP solution for you that has hopefully worked in a couple of other organizations with some great success. So. Talked about supply chain management in uh, last week's lecture. And uh, just to highlight a few things as it relates to ERP, the typical system might also address possible issues related to planning, vendor selection, manufacturing, logistics, and customer relationships. So you wouldn't necessarily think of a supply chain management system supporting customer relationship. But you never would think of actually an ERP system supporting CRM as well, customer relationship, but some of them do actually. So there's a little fine line between what kind of system is this thing? You know, it's like uh, there's so much convergence these days in terms of the relationship building. Is the relationship with the customer? Is the relationship with the client? Well, if it's a relationship you're housing, why not put it together all in one system? So some people use the supply chain management system to do a lot of the relationship management and some of the enterprise resource planning. So this kind of custom system... Uh, company might need really depends on what it's really going to be used for. 
terms of the solution. Think of it more like a problem solution. So here's our business processes that are in the middle here. I mean, here's our suppliers and here's our customers. Why shouldn't the customer, why shouldn't the supply chain management program also help with customer relationship management? It works with it. And raw materials, finished products go to the customers. Um, suppliers supply the information for us. Payments go back out. So, and going through the car manufacturer um, kind of concept, if we can divide it all out by supplier, then when a car sells, the window guy can make money, and the transmission guy can make money, and everyone gets paid uh, by share of whatever part or piece they're supplying in the partnered relationship. And it's directly tied to when a customer purchases it. So if a customer's not buying anything, well, suppliers shouldn't be supplying anything. So it's a win-win all the way around, hopefully. So with the uh, internet and e-business, we have different uh, things that our supply chain management system actually does. Um, most importantly, the systems vendors uh, provide the ERP system. They modify the products to include web-based interfaces as well, um, which is kind of like the example with uh, bookstores and um, publishers. So a bookstore that work, has a relationship with a publisher who also has a relationship with a customer who has an inventoryless inventory less stock that's going directly from supplier to the customer and they're just the middle person who's sitting there facilitating the sale and we through a web-based interface so the ultimate goal it's actually kind of like Amazon when you buy something on Amazon and you're buying it from somebody else you're not buying it from Amazon Amazon doesn't have any say in that at all it's like eBay does eBay sell you anything no well they do they sell you ads <laughs> or they sell you they sell you listings or whatever, you pay for the listings, but uh, you don't necessarily, you know, you can't buy a stereo on eBay, and actually eBay knows what stereo you bought. In fact, they probably don't know half of the products um, or services that might be actually sold on that. Hello. So, all right, so looking at some more buzzwords for you, two basic types of supply chain management systems, and they are supply chain planning software, so more acronyms for you, basically. And the business world loves acronyms for some reason. Um, there's a supply chain planning system, and there's supply chain exec ex execution software. Well, what does the planning system do that? It uses mathematical models to predict inventory levels based on efficient flow of resources into the supply chain. Well, we can actually do real-time inventory management these days as well. If you have a proper supply chain management system, maybe that's linked or part of an enterprise resource planning system. As soon as you buy something at a store, we already know, the vendor already knows that when they're going to need to fulfill this order again. Um, because it automatically, the sales transaction deducts it from the inventory. The inventory takes in that there's a, another system that's looking at inventory levels and this automatically has an algorithm built into it to determine optimal levels of inventory and then patterns in terms of how fast things are moving. So it can predict ahead of time which day something needs to arrive to replenish the inventory before the inventory runs out. So theoretically, the store should never run out of anything if everything was working properly. And also price levels can also be adjusted depending upon the demand as well and, you know, the supply demand kind of concept. So the execution, so that would be the planning end of the software. So the planning end of it um, predicts, does analysis, determines, how many people um, need to be working, how much inventory do we need, uh, when should it arrive, when should we order, and then also can make, maybe make adjustments to inventory levels to optimize you know, what, what stock level we have. So we only have one or two of something in stock at all times. And we don't have to go back there and physically kind of count it or make sure we have it. It automatically gets replenished for us. Which is kind of interesting because, you know, boxes show up at the shipping and receiving and those people take it out and stock the shelf with it and, you know, it's one sold yesterday and now we got a new one in today. You know, it's a very fast flowing uh, concept. So e execution software is used to automate the different steps in the supply chain such as um, sending purchase orders to vendors and, or when inventories reach uh, specific levels. So. There's a concept of predicting when to buy, and then there's the act of actually sending the order. So the system can do both, essentially. Um, in, in true automation, it should be doing both. <coughs> so major players in uh, supply chain processing 
or planning, the first step here, I2 Technologies, Oracle, SAP, your, your basic players, advanced planning and optimization through SAP. So that's why a lot of people actually write customized uh, systems to do the optimizing and the planning. Here's advanced planning and optimization for APO, and it's kind of a kind of a screenshot of a very old actual SAP interface to it on a Windows old Windows system. But, uh, it's showing you how you can sort of automate, um, eh, you know, kind of automate the process using tools, software tools, software tools to help with the planning and the automation. So. So levels of planning, we have supply chain network design, supply chain cockpit as an example, demand planning, supply network planning, <coughs> collaborative planning, forecast and replenishment planning, things of that nature. So you just basically take all the needs and divide it out into different modules and then uh, use some pre-built uh, middleware or like SAP, I really consider it a middleware kind of approach to it or you kind of build the custom planning um, I wouldn't have to go as far as calling it an algorithm, but system or plan, I should say, to facilitate all of the different functions. What does this do? It eliminates a human from having to manually do it. <laughs> so you're building the automation into a planning system, making it part of the supply chain management program, and then having the program essentially, um, say, determine everything, and then you have the humans that are working for the program, essentially. But don't humans work for programs all the time anyway? I mean, isn't that what our job is? Yeah. We all work for programs. So. Oracle Supply Chain Planning, another vendor, another kind of approach to it. Very similar. There's going to be a lot of similarities between all of these different vendors and all these different systems. They actually have a separate supply chain planning uh, system that's a part of the e-business, Oracle e-business suites, uh, which probably has changed a bit from the slide set. Um, they uh, are still in the business of doing this, uh, but their products constantly change, which is good, actually. Uh, so we have solutions that include demand planning, collaborative planning. There's actually a web-based interface to this as well. Yeah, uh, and inventory optimization, scheduling. So different types of approaches um, to the solution. Most people, um, most companies, are going to go with this. And this, I don't call this off the shelf, but I call this pre-built modules or pre-built systems where you're not going to reinvent the wheel. If you're doing something that another company is doing, you're going to get a provided from a vendor some sort of a system that you're going to be able to customize, hopefully, and take that system and adapt it to work with your business processes in your business environment. Because if all businesses were the same, and all businesses sold the same products and did the same thing, there wouldn't be any competition in the world. <laughs> so obviously, you're going to need to change things to adapt to the way that your company is doing business. So. Lo and behold, as a consumer, everyone in the room probably has at one point in their life been victims of the customer relationship management program. It's the automated system that calls you after you took your car in for a service or something, or it's the, or it's the uh, postcard that you get in the mail about your upcoming appointment, or it's the call during dinner time to cross-sell you on something, or find out how much you like the product or the salesperson or the service. It's all about managing the customer. So customer relationship management, there's software systems out there for this that are called, uh, some of them are mostly electronic these days, so eCRM systems using technology for e-business, managing the customer base. So how can you manage your customer base? See, in the old days, people just thought customer goes to a store, buys something, goes away, and they're no longer a customer. Now, every time you, like, look for information on a company, you turn into a customer. Whether you even bought anything or not, you're automatically determined to be a customer. Maybe you're a future customer, or maybe you are a previous customer, who knows. Uh, but the concept is uh, grab your market, and it's easily done through social media these days as well, and it's easily done through internet technology. So whether you realize it or not, you're being housed and mined and collected and queried and you know, a bunch of statistics are done on you, and the company knows everything about you, theoretically, and then it sells you a new product, hopefully. So the better a relationship you have with your customers as a business, the more profitable you are, because the more loyalty and the, you know, the better customers you're going to have, as if you could actually do that. Um, so it's not, if you're a bad business and you have a bad product, it doesn't matter how much customer relationship management you do, 
we're still not going to be very, very successful in the end. Uh, but customer relationship management allows e-businesses to match customer needs with products, plans, and offerings. Remind customers of service requirements. Determine what products the customer has purchased, what they might need to purchase in the future. So, who knew? Who knew that somebody else was telling you what you're going to buy next? Actually, Apple does it all the time. <laughs> Good companies that have, here's Salesforce.com, good companies that manage their companies correctly or their customers correctly and their suppliers correctly and everything um, are trying to understand. They're, they're making an attempt to understand the customer these days. Here's a, another thing that you're probably a, a member of from time to time. Different company contacts for different salespeople and different sales centers. So this is a Salesforce.com, a very old screenshot of a very old web-based system. That is managing leads and customers. So it's just an example of um, different uh, ways of tracking information on people and managing so that you don't actually kind of duplicate efforts for the most part. This is an outsourced solution for the most part. It's a service if you haven't heard of it. Um, got its big advertising a couple of Super Bowls ago. <laughs> Salesforce.com. Um, actually, I'm going to be out four or five Super Bowls ago or so, I don't know. But it's been, the company's been around for a long time. Uh, no one's beat them out yet. It seems to be a household word these days. Um, you buy licenses, so many seats, you know, how many salespeople you got. And it's easy to customize it, easy to grow it as you go through. And uh, it's just a way of keeping track of information that you're going to need. So we have multi-channeled CRM. Uh, here's our mobile devices going on here. Um, and we have our multi-channeled sort of ability to um, send email, text message, um, social media, friend requests, uh, friend this, friend that, whatever. Uh, different ways of contacting the customer, essentially, with different outlets. Now, if I were to update this slide set, I'd add in social media in here for customer relationship management. So social media tries to build a relationship with you. And you know, if they think of the concept, if you're on a social media website like Facebook or something, you know, you're, you're on there because you want to keep in touch with people you know. <sighs> Do you really want to be used for marketing? No, not really. I wouldn't know actually because I'm not on it. But uh, I, I certainly would hesitate, you know, thinking, I, I cert wouldn't hesitate thinking that somebody's profiting from some of the comments that I make or someone is learning about the what, what do consumers want or trying to sell me a product or a service or something. Um, it's kind of like how in the old days, you know, people originally didn't like commercials on TV. You know, it's like, why do I have to listen to it? And then there was this joke for a while that things were subliminal. You got subliminal messages through the commercials. You watched it, and the background says, buy our product, buy our product. You need this, you need this, or you're hungry. Go to this restaurant, you're hungry. Go to this, you know, subliminal messages and stuff. And then, you know, that was kind of hype. Actually, there is no such thing. As, and you know what they do is they also raise the volume on commercials. But the, the FCC said, no, you can't do that anymore. But for the longest time, you know, you're watching a TV show and all of a sudden, wow, really loud comes on this commercial for Jack in a Box. Wow, it wakes you up. Jack in a Box. Oh, Jack in a Box. And then you, then you go out and buy Jack in a Box or something. Um, but anyway, people have the same problem with social media right now. So it's like, well... Do I really want someone marketing something to me, you know? And then who am I meeting? And what is this, what is this all about? And why why does I why do I keep seeing this ad? And why do I get this email now about this or that, you know? Um, it's not enough to get spam mail about Viagra and stuff. Now we have to get it on other products too. <laughs> so <laughs> there's only so much the spam filter can can filter out as well. So. This is the hugest, biggest area, however, and you're looking at the slide that represents it. Data mining and web mining and business intelligence. This is Google's main business. Google is a data miner. So you think that they're offering you free Gmail and they're offering you YouTube and they're offering you all this. Oh, no, 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 no. It's all a ploy. It's like those subliminal messages to go buy Jack in a Box or whatever. It's, uh, they're data mining. The more you put out there, the more information they get, the more data they get, the more data mining they can get. Data mining is an interesting concept. It's a process of using techniques. Now, this one, the slide says mathematical techniques. Okay, algorithmic techniques, math. They're math-based, but they're alg algorithms, uh, software algorithms, to look at patterns in a group of data. They're by discovering previously unknown relationships among many different pieces of information stored in a database. So instead of the differences between databases, which is topic number two for tonight, and web mining, 
is that or data mining, which is now turned into web mining, and is that in a database we know what we're looking for and we ask the database <coughs> for the information. In web mining and data mining, we don't know what we're looking for. We tell the data to tell us what it sees. So the data tells us the information, it's the other way around. So we don't initiate the search, we don't know what we're looking for. Instead, the data tells us its patterns. So the data comes back and says, hey, people like to travel in June. June. <coughs> well, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> hey, people spend more money in December. Yeah, that's a no-brainer either. But it tells us other things that may not be a no-brainer, like um, tablets are bad. You know, actually, I don't know, tablets aren't really bad, tablets are good. I don't know, I'm just making that up. But um, Or that... Um, this particular country or this particular area um, has a tendency to have vegetarians or something. Or, you know, so it tells us that d based upon stuff it sees and patterns it sees. So if you were to throw a bunch of um, rabbit animals out there or, you know, put a bunch of stuff out there, you need a bunch of stuff to do this with. The larger your data set, the more data mining you can do. Google, that's why Google's like the biggest data mining company out there. And let people write emails back and forth to each other. Let's see what the emails say. So we take the information that's in the emails, that's in all the posts and the docs and everything that you use, and discover things about people. So it's an intelligent way of learning about <coughs> customers, learning about people, patterns in society, you know, um, has um, the level of depression gone up or down? Um, are people happy with their jobs? Are, and it comes back and it just basically tells a lot of information. <coughs> It's kind of like how people, um, you know, you look at a, you know, the psychi psych psychiatrists have been doing this for years, you know. You can tell what, how a person is thinking by showing them a plot, or what do they call those things, those, you know, those little funny little things. What do you see? The psychologist shows the pictures, shows a bunch of cards with a bunch of pictures on them. They look like um, finger painting things or whatever. They look like, you know, something a kid did. And then depending upon what you see in there, it says something about who you are, or what you're thinking, or your mental state or something. So you hold it up and say, I see a dinosaur. Oh, I see a kitchen sink. Oh, I see a, you know, and whatever you see, well, that's what data mining is. It tells you, it's you telling Google what, what you see. What are you seeing? Oh, we're seeing that um, this company is really doing well. We're seeing that... Uh, you know, the average uh, income is uh, discretionary spending has shifted towards tablet market, or we're seeing this, or we're seeing that. And then plus it also accumulates everything you type into the search engine. So you search on something. We'll take everything everybody always type into the search engine and see, well, how many people search on this? How many people search on that? What are their age groups? What are this is the demographic we're looking at to tell, well, what is it that these people want? So as a relationship with customer relationship. It could be used a lot with that. Uh, so a data warehouse is a database that contains huge amounts of data such as customers and sales data. So data mining is not a database concept. It's actually the exact reverse of it. <coughs> instead of, um, you know, in, instead of knowing we don't know, we rely upon the data mining activity to tell us information. A data warehouse <coughs> takes a bunch of databases and puts them all together and allows us to aggregate the information. So we can take sales data from all the car manufacturers, everybody. We can take sales data from the, from the census, census bureau, and we can figure out what's the average age of the person who buys a car in this country, or how many miles do they drive a year or something. Or you know, We can come up with all this information by combining the techniques together. So what does data mining do? Here's a little example here, what data mining does. Explores your data, finds patterns, performs predictions, learns the patterns. So data mining can be applied towards stock market analysis, towards weather, weather data actually can be done that way. In fact, if I were to data mine the conditions of today, I'd say this is earthquake weather. <laughs> but I hate saying that because every time I say that, if I data mine all the times I've said that, we've had an earthquake. So, because we have shifts in the weather pattern, it usually happens in October, September, October, is when we this happens, when we have nice, beautiful 80 degrees, and then we have rain, 70 degrees, and then it pops back up to 80 degrees. And go online, you figure out everyone's predicting an everyone's predicting an earthquake right now. So, buckle down, <laughs> the earth's gonna start shaking any minute now, <laughs> because um, 
That's what the data mining tells us. Do we really know that? No, it's a prediction. It's a guess. Sometimes the accuracy of the guess can be improved, however, the more information we keep acquiring. So if it, we've had earthquakes the last three years at this time of year, which we have actually have from what I've been reading, not to make everyone paranoid or anything, but I, I, I would almost put money on the fact that we're going to have an earthquake in California. Probably Wednesday or Thursday, because that's when the, the pattern's going back up to 90 degrees. We have a huge shift in the temperature, so that's usually what causes the earthquakes. <laughs> anyway, we'll see what happens next week, and they tell me if we had an earthquake. So, and it, watch, watch, watch us have one, actually. This is really bad. <laughs> Not saying I predicted it or anything, but we'll see what happens. I've been wrong. I'm known to be wrong constantly. Uh, querying reporting analysis gives us the what. Data mining tells us why or how. How come you think we're going to have the earthquake? Well, because I'm looking at the weather patterns and the tradition and the shifts and the timing. So, Actually, if you go back through the census, through, through the earthquake data, they have predictions that happen constantly. You can always see it. Ah, oh, we predict this month. We predict. They've been doing that for years. No one's ever gotten it correct, though. And I'm. I'm not saying. I'm not even close. Likelihood of us having an earthquake by the end of this week, I'd say, very slim. <laughs> All right. So, uh, SQL services and business intelligence. Back in 2005, when the first system for SQL Server came out, this slide's kind of hard to read. Uh, but it looks at the concept of the server and through its integrated services, its analysis, and its reporting features. Being able to take um, a bunch of data from a database perspective. This is, oh, this is, by the way, is the database perspective compared to the data mining perspective. So a database we query, we report, we do analysis, and we come up with what does the data give us. On the data mining end, it gives us the why do you think and how do you know that, you know, how do you know that the, we're going to have a problem in the housing market? Or how do you know, why do you think that? And it's because of the mining information that comes back that tells us that. We're, we're basically asking, we're not asking, we're, we're requesting that the data tell us something. But we don't know what it's going to tell us. Now, we have ideas about what we're looking for when we ask that question. So... From a server perspective, from integrated services, we can do the data acquisition from source systems and integration and data itself that gets transformed and synthesized into the data en enrichment with business logic and hierarchical views of it, all the way to the representation, to the reports that come out of it from a database perspective. And this is what some of the services do for us. And then we have algorithms that look at decisions, trees, and clustering, and time series. If you take a data mining course, it's usually there's a big focus on cluster concepts, clustering, clustering sequences, associations. If you uh, follow some of the social media stuff right now, it's all about associations. You know, in fact, there's a ranking that you can do on a person. Um, depending upon what type of number of people they associate with. In fact, there's a couple of human resource applications out there that predict your suitability for certain jobs, depending upon your associations, which is kind of funny because what if you don't associate with anyone? Does that mean you're not able to do any jobs? So, so it's garbage in, garbage out, I guess. But uh, long story short, um, it's not necessarily the how many in terms of the number of connections you have, how many people have you befriended, it's like who are they? So if you can analyze who they are, then you can probably pick out terrorists in a group, maybe. Who knows? Well, that's what the government's trying to do. Or you could pick out um, potential future friends or something. Or you could pick out, you know, oh, maybe all my friends are lawyers, maybe I should be a lawyer. I associate with a lot of lawyers or something, or I don't know. Or maybe they're something about the time series. So you can look at time changes, clustering, decision trees. People who bought this and have bought this and bought this also bought this, which is what's your decision tree. That's a data mining application, by the way. Uh, actually, that's a good example, using a decision tree. So um, most of your booksellers, most of your retailers that do some sort of an association will say, you're buying this product, and and then it'll go through and it'll data mine for you to figure out what it, what goes with this product because we want to sell something else to this customer. 
and then it'll tell you that from decision making that other people have made from a decision tree perspective if you bought this, this, and this, most likely you're going to want to buy that one <laughs> or you're going to hold that one for the future so that when the customer logs back in a couple weeks from now, hey look we got something new it's that one that was associated with all the other ones that you bought or something uh, you know, maybe it's a book by the same author or something uh, Bayesian networks that look at statistics and probability what, and form <coughs> connections between different associations or different sequences or different decisions that are made amongst different groups of data. So we can run it through a, a Bayesian network. Um, neural networks, this is all artificial intelligence and data mining in terms of the algorithms. And then this is what's going into those products that do the data mining, essentially. Not on the list here is genetic algorithms. Genetic algorithms are pretty hot these days in terms of data mining. Uh, you can see the associations, but you, also, you can also see the patterns. If you see the patterns, then you can predict future patterns. So, Relationships among supply chain management, enterprise resource planning, and customer relationship management. They're broader supply chain management. They all go into the same category which is why we can stick them all into a system. Call the system ERP, call the system supply chain. Eh, rarely do you call the system a customer relationship management system because people think that's only servicing the customer. It's not really servicing the supply chain, but it, it fits well in the other two categories. So. Uh, let's see, systems, applications, and products. That's what SAP stands for, if you didn't know. <laughs> systems, applications, and products in data processing. Now nah, that's a big word. You can go. Actually, we used to have an SAP certificate here. We take SAP and ERP classes in our business department here at ITU, actually. And you can get a certificate after you take a test, I, I think, an SAP exam, um, which um, I don't know certifies you, <laughs> certified to be certifiable, uh, to work with these systems to build them. So if you have an interest in it from a technical perspective, um, it's more hands-on. So it's a uh, Easy EAP or SAP. Easy S S. Oh, I was reading out S A P. <laughs> Hello, just read out those symbols. Just read out the characters. Not SAP. No SAPI here. Uh, I like the stuff used in maple syrup that you put on pancakes. Like SAP. Is that SAP? Syrup. SAP. No, SAP comes from trees, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they don't want to be called SAP or SAP. So they can quickly separate the real SAP people from the newbie fakes is when they call it SAP. Actually, you get that with programming languages all the time. And you say, uh, what do they say? Um, they try to spell something out, or I don't know. Can't think of the language right now. No one mispronounces Java or C++, but there's a couple of other languages out there that you can mispronounce quite easily. Oh, ML. Mu. What is what, what is that? It's ML. Okay, so fourth generation or fourth largest, excuse me, fourth largest software vendor in the world. Yeah, it's actually I'd put it up even higher these days. They, they pretty much beat they beat out the uh, well they beat out work well they they beat out PeopleSoft long ago because uh, the problem with that is that PeopleSoft is too too hard. The education that you have to get for it, the training that you need for PeopleSoft is like twice as amount that you need for SAP. So SAP is definitely because it's easier to use, easier to train, and more available. And their certificate program and their training is more accessible. It has become more popular. Plus, also, a lot of people will argue and say it's better. It's a better platform, more flexibility, more ability to adapt and, um, you know, customize the system. It's easier to work with. So. There's a partial SAP client list here, Disney, AT&T. You can probably take and put, you know, twice or three times as many companies on here right now actually. That's just a partial list. So Before SAP revision 3, I don't know what revision we're up to now, but it's going to be probably higher I think. I don't know. I don't know what revision. Uh, systems didn't talk about um, the extent of processes required. In spite of 20 years of IS labor, they did not even talk about business processes. Now they talk about it. So they before we used to have some human glue that held things together, you know, like Instead of um, 
electronic processing instead of um, EDI or some forms or electronic e data exchange and things of that nature. We had people manually faxing something or people carrying something over or taking data from one system and adding it into another. So a lot of these systems actually helped to get rid of the people. And when I say get rid of the people, it means make it more automated, introduce the business automation that's needed and the intelligence that's needed without having to have someone manually do something. It's like, why would you pull out a typewriter these days? When you don't have to, you can pull out a word processor. So, uh, let's see, reconcile multiple different views of the data to arrive at an answer or conclusion. And then monitor uh, hold points to ensure that procedures are uh, followed against the disorganization of being part of paper and part automated. So. You get this when you see a change in process. When things used to be in paper, it's like a, it's actually kind of like ITU's student registration now. Is it all electronic? Or do you still fill anything out? But the funny thing is, is I think you still apply to the university in paper. <laughs> and then uh, you probably still pay in paper. I don't know. Do they do electronic payments? With your tuition? Yeah? Oh, good. So they have it all. They took the paper away from everything, which is good. What ends up happening is usually there's some sort of a paper-based process, and then there's the electronic-based process, and then there's a human who has to glue them together. <laughs> Look, we received all the paperwork, <coughs> and now we have to update the system. <coughs> so you do it all paper or all electronic, one or the other. So. Uh, see, what we're looking at here is just a big picture of a bridging a system with paper <coughs> processes. What you don't want to do is have the bridges with the paper processes. Put it all together in an electronic system because here's the system here and then here's all the connections you got to do. This is a manual effort with human glue to put everything together. So you can write a script, put it together, have the system actually glue it together without the human. Now how much <coughs> labor these red lines represent? <laughs> That's a lot of human glue, actually in that we're still doing, uh, we're still, we're not, autom we haven't automated everything in terms of the classes though. So the department <coughs> chairs still pick out classes and we still hand them by email to the registration office and they still manually schedule stuff on different days and stuff. So I'm waiting for that to be automated as well. So you just say, hey, I want to teach this class and it goes into the system and it gets on the schedule without anybody having to look at it or something. So it gives us efficiency, process efficiency. So it's realized through the ability to reduce the personnel required to perform a process. You know, can you register completely online? Can you process, which I would hope that the DMV has improved, but I don't know if they have or not. You still gotta go to there to pick up stickers and stuff. No, actually they mail stickers these days. So you know, if you wanna renew your car, you can do that online. But if you have anything that's not standard, it doesn't work that way. So you transfer it into processes that are able to meet customer requirements and they're all electronic. So the key enabler here is one system. So we have one system is omnifunctional, fully integrated, process oriented, off the shelf, ready to go. You just slap it down, plug it in and it works. Actually that's how our computer systems are these days now. It has all the software on there that you need. It does everything you want it to do. Hopefully. And uh, the goal, that's what the goal of some of these SAP products are, is to give you a, a solution. So customer relationship management, business process reengineering, strategic enterprise, business warehousing, stuff like that. So. Microsoft Dynamics screenshot. I have not actually worked with Microsoft Dynamics um, but uh, personally, but because uh, I'm not really a huge fan of Microsoft products in general. But uh, in terms of the concept, it was formerly Microsoft Business Solutions from Great Plains. So I'm sure that they have gone um, throughout the last few years since the making of the slides that they have probably expanded their uh, scope a bit, I would hope. Um, bring supply chain functions online, makes things visible, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with team collaboration, wherever employees and vendors are in business processes and portals and technology. So it's hardware considerations, database requirements are also necessary uh, for small businesses that may not necessarily have big old Oracle systems or might not necessarily have anything at all. Actually, I have found that in general, Microsoft solutions are geared towards small businesses, even like the SQL Server products. I don't see them as a big business company, although I might be wrong and people might disagree with me on that. Even in the area of databases, you know, in fact, who uses Microsoft Access? 
I don't, you know, no company's going to use it. It's personal people that are going to use it. So I don't really see them as a leader in the business market. I see them in the consumer market, though. And I see them as an operating system vendor. Eh, you can't beat Microsoft Office, though. <laughs> it's the de facto standard, so... I don't know, I might be wrong, completely wrong, what I just said. So They may not necessarily be uh, geared entirely towards the consumer market, because Office products are for business people. So. But consumers use them. But businesses use them, so I don't know. Anyway, tools for web page development and site management. This also changes rapidly, and so do the technologies. I see Microsoft as a huge, especially in the area of SAP and uh, the .NET technology. I see them, and Microsoft servers. I see them as a huge, um, even Visual Basic is used a lot in businesses. Visual Studio products. Yeah, I see them huge in that area. So. Uh, versus, uh, well, nobody else actually does anything very well. We have JSP. It's harder to work with, though. I think the ASP mark is a little easier. The packaging is a bit easier in terms of having to, your ability to deploy it and what you can do with it without having to have an extensive education on it. It's a little bit easier. It's kind of like the difference between SAP and PeopleSoft, actually, when I think about it. But uh, it's just one avenue. So I take it back. Microsoft is for business people, too, <laughs> and developers. All right, so languages for the Internet, we know H HTML, I hope. Uh, CGI has gone away. CSS is still around Java. Java. You can add uh, VB script on there, too, for the Visual Basic. Java. Java is still around. In fact, a lot of people say Java is the de facto standard now for web development, but we'll see about that in the next coming years. Uh, XML, uh, yeah, XSL for data transfer, yeah. Software, uh, front page, I don't know. Flash still has a still has a stronghold on the market, even despite um, Apple's um, conformity to it, <laughs> so or willingness to accept it. Uh, because it does have some vulnerabilities in it. So anyway, there's a lot of drama with that. Dreamweaver is still popular. So hardware considerations for supply chain management systems. Well, do we want to go intra or extra in terms of the internet? Internet is uh, to use is to use internet technology to TCP/IP for the internal communications, or extranet to use the internet technology portal for internal and supplier communications. So break it out to uh, limited subnets or um, extranets to going out to suppliers. Actually, if you can set up a pretty secure intranet that allows your suppliers to log into it from a remote using an RSA key or something, some, some sort of security level to it. And then you can have your suppliers actually come in and they can update you on their orders, you know, and like something's going to arrive and they can tell you without you having to tell them. So they're a better communication line. We also have a network infrastructure. Um, everyone's heard of uh, networks as well as WANs and LANs. If you take a technology, uh, excuse me, telecommunications course, um, you'll learn about different networking technologies. Uh, right now, everything is internet based instead of private networks, uh, which is easier. So, global considerations in using uh, supply chain management ERP systems. Well, there's time differences, currency differences, exchange rate differences, language issues, tax. Tax is a big one, actually, for the internet as well. Different accounting systems, security restrictions, culture and religious holidays. Yeah, if you're uh, working with a manufacturing uh, that's overseas, holidays are generally the biggest issue. Uh, in other countries, they take the entire week off. You know, actually, for the religious holidays in the United States, we'll be lucky to have Christmas Eve, Christmas Day off, and then the next day, people are back to work. Other countries, like for the New Year's, they take like, well, I think this is in China, actually. They take like weeks off, like a week off for Chinese New Year. Everything closes down. The entire country goes, goes on holiday. You never see that in the U.S., actually. They're not going to go on a holiday for, oops, this is operating systems, holiday for uh, a week. How could you afford to do that, you know, or even a week? There's people that won't even take a weekend off. They won't even, like, you know, put their stuff down for a weekend. So. I want to talk about databases next. So right now what I'm doing is thumbing through to find my database. Nope, this isn't it. I think it's going to be this one, actually. Yep, 
databases and data warehouses. So this is on the MIT, this is the technology, another one. Uh, so we just finished uh, number five on the technology. So to continue our focus on emerging technology, not emerging, but uh, basis for engineering management technologies, uh, which has kind of been the focus for the last couple of weeks here. Uh, databases and data warehousing and building business intelligence through the use of these um, techniques. So looking at listing the described and characteristics of a relational model, uh, defining uh, five software components of the uh, database management system, describing key characteristics of data warehousing. So some people who, this is not going to be a technical lecture, this is going to be a, from a management perspective, um, how are you going to make this work for you from a strategic capabilities of the, the technology, the role of the business intelligence, uh, and the key considerations of the information ownership, actually, which is kind of interesting. Can companies keep your personal information private and secure? Actually, if you are uh, working in this area and you have been around since the year 2005, I believe it was, you know that you can't keep information anymore. The government has told you that you can't and that you can be held uh, responsible for keeping information longer than its intended use, or keeping too many pieces of information about a customer or mining. So it's just kind of interesting. So how come Google can do that? Because they're not keeping it. You're keeping it. It's in your account. And if it's in your account, you're responsible for it. They're not responsible for it. So you're responsible for everything you own. If you own it on their <coughs> server, can they use it? That's going to be an interesting question. It's not going to come up until another couple more years when Google actually starts using it and we start seeing it being used more. So it's being used now with the Google circles and the connections with people. Oh, you might know this person. Well, LinkedIn does it too. But uh, eventually there's going to be a, some controversy in terms of can they use that information? Who owns the information? You know. Um, so databases um, are large repositories of detailed information, usually. And although you're accumulating, although Google, as I mentioned before, is doing data mining, they're also keeping databases. There's not relational databases, but they're accumulating, storing, housing, and keeping the data long after you delete it as well. It's just accumulated and housed, which turns into a database. Not a relational database, but it's a database in concept. Much of the information is personal. Organizations must protect the information from theft and loss. So you're actually now held a, about, well, we had the Healthcare Protection Act and the Data Protection Act. So we, had, we had a bunch of acts that came out in the middle of the year, 2000, middle of the 2000s. So about 2005, 2006-ish. So if you are a company and you post something that's incorrect on a customer and you have information that is incorrect on a customer, you could be held criminally or liability, responsible for any damages associated with your housing of that bad information. So are you going to put health records online? No. <laughs> because how many people go to die? Oh, you have a headache. Oh, you might have this. And that gets published. Then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you don't get a job because you have this. Oh, no, 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 no. It said you might have this. Uh, okay. Long story short, you're not going to take that responsibility if you're a healthcare company. You're not going to put anything online. You're not going to put billing information online, payment history. You're not going to make credit card reports visible, which is actually kind of an interesting scenario, uh, which is what's going on these days. But you're not going to make things visible because you don't want to be held liable if it's incorrect. <coughs> and you also don't want to be held responsible for the loss or theft of that particular information. So you gave out somebody's credit card number. Well, if you're the company that gave it out, you're responsible for it. So, or the government comes in and says, "Hey, why do you have all these credit card company, oh, credit card numbers? You're responsible for it. <laughs> so, you're not supposed to be keeping per people's personal information like that. Many bad people want to steal your personal information from companies uh, that did, you do business with. So now the companies are being held responsible. So big information loss examples: card systems, 40 million customers; Citigroup, 3.9 million. DSW Shoe Warehouse, 1.4 million customers. Actually, I can add to the list of about less than a month ago, Lucky's Supermarkets <laughs> got huge debit card exposure uh, from uh, card readers. Actually, they've been, it's been going around California for like since May. 
Yeah, it, usually grocery stores, now they're hitting, gro no, excuse me, gas stations were the original target. Now they're hitting grocery stores. When you swipe your card to use a credit card, to pay for your purchase with a credit card at a store or gas station, there's people that, uh, in, is there's a whole link of these organized crime. That it's all organized. And uh, they put like a little reader inside of it. So the magnetic reader records, and then you accumulate it for a couple months or a month or so, and then they come in and they pull a little chip out that has all the information on it. So you pretty much gave them your credit card information, and then they use it. They sell it, or they use it to make purchases with and stuff like that. Um, it's happening a lot, actually, in uh, gas stations in San Jose, in Santa Clara, right in our neighborhood here. And recently, as of, I, I want to say it was like uh, about two weeks ago, Lucky's... That one, actually, the one right around my house got hit. <coughs> Luckily, I don't go to that store, but they had notices all over the place. If you've used your credit card here, check your balance. <laughs> check your statements, because we've been compromised. <laughs> and then who's responsible? Lucky's. If you can tell that it came from that store, the company, now is about year 2005, 2006, something like that. I can't remember the exact date. It was in the mid-2000s. The uh, government decided to hold the company responsible for it. So what's the company going to do? Not accept credit cards? So I don't know how they're going to get past that problem. Well, they're trying to crack down. They're trying to remove all of the readers. But uh, there's actually one. I saw it on a TV episode, actually. You can put it on a fake card. You put it in there, and you swipe it through, and it sticks to the end. It's like a, a real thin, sticky piece of uh, magnetic uh, receiver. That has like a little, it's got to be small, I don't know. But you put it, you stick it on the card, you swipe the card through, and it sticks on the inside of the reader. And then you're lucky if it stays there, and then people, after that, they swipe cards. And the reader picks up the information, and you will process the transaction, but it filters through this little sticker thing that accumulates the information. So it saves it. So then you stick the other card in there, and it pulls it off. You know, it's kind of like push it on, pull it off kind of thing. And I'm sure some of them get lost. Some of them end up getting ruined or don't stick properly or something. Not probably not very reliable, but it works because people have compromised numbers. And then the other thing too is they actually open it up. So they originally they were trying to link it to service people. You know, who would open the thing up to put it? How are you going to open one up? There's a big line of people. You're going to open up the okay, okay. Now I can use it. You know, you're not going to do that. So you're going to get it in there some other way. Because if you're going to do that, you're going to be easily spotted because you're the person who works on it. Unless you happen to be uh, posing, which is what the old scam that people do all the pizza delivery guy, which is not really a pizza delivery guy, or telephone repairman. You know, you come in and then you bug the entire room or you do something, you know, because you're the telephone repairman. So, be, oh, yeah, telephone repairman, come on in. You're going to watch the telephone repairman or the TV repairman or the mechanic who comes in to do something to the house. You're not going to pay attention to what they're doing. So, I mean, like story short, if you want to get into that line of work, it's very risky. <laughs> but I don't recommend it. You have to be a master of impersonations. <laughs> Questions. Have you been a victim of identity theft? Probably. Uh, what do you do to protect yourself from identity theft? Don't go online. <laughs> How many organizations have your credit card number? Millions. Everyone who's ever used it. Who was ever who you've ever given? That's why people like PayPal actually for online shopping. So. All right, businesses use IT tools to manage and organize their information and their data. So we have online transaction processing, OLTP, gathering and processing information and updating existing information to reflect processing information. So the systems themselves are also vulnerable, but it depends on the security and the the higher level quality of the system in terms of how much compromise is actually possible. So we also have OLAP, everyone's heard of this if you've taken a database or a data technology course in terms of uh, online analytical processing is what that buzzword stands for, manipulating of information to support decision making. So scheduling systems, um, banking systems, um, airline flight scheduling, um, management for uh, decision support systems for shifts and stuff. And even vacation scheduling and stuff like that can be done through an OLAP system. So in the area of transaction processing, it supports operational processing, sales orders, 
accounts receivable, supported by operational databases. So there's usually a database backend to all, even your credit card systems are database backend. Um, credit card processing services, which is the one that does most of the outsourcing of all of the store processing. Past the terminal level, it's all done online. So all of those things are connected wirelessly or wired to a network. And you have a main, main central database that's keeping track of all this stuff. Because why, you know, why duplicate efforts? Payment comes in, goes to here, goes to there. Get, the customer gets uh, deducted. The merchant gets credited. And then you have a report you print out at the end of the day. And nobody has to do anything. It's a system that does it all. And it keeps track of everything. It has to. Puts in a database so it can archive it and go back in time and say, yeah, you did. Here it is. There's your signature. You made that purchase. Or the consumer can, you know, fight something or the merchant can fight something. So online analytical processing is also done using a database backend. It helps build database intelligence supported by data warehousing and data mining tools and receives data from transaction processing systems. So just think of the uh, transaction processing as the interface with the merchant or interface with the clients or the customer in terms of the receivables or the payables. And then the analytical processing is um, how are you going to build the intelligence into that? So here's our business intelligence combination here where we have information on one side and we have business intelligence on the other side. Because you know they're not the same thing. <laughs> the information is what's actually being stored. So a lot of companies think they have business intelligence because they have the information. They just don't know what to do with it. But they don't really have any intelligence because they have no idea how to read it, what to do with it. So what's the information? <clears throat> it comes from database products and services and things, advertising databases and customer relationship databases, and all the different programs that the company installs if it's not in one ERP system, if it's in separate different programs. All the accumulations over here of all of the different database information that might be stored. Um, most of the transaction processing gets done, gets saved, because you want to be able to archive everything. Every time you've done a shopping cart purchase, every time you've done anything, that transaction's been saved, hopefully, if the company's smart. And then you can take and turn that into database intelligence and business intelligence by combining it all together and then making decisions on it. So that's why this warehouse is over here on the right-hand side and the different products are on the left-hand side. The purpose of the warehouse is to put it all together. So here, if, if inventory levels are reduced by 10%, what is the new total cost of the inventory carried? Well, that's something that the warehouse could tell us. Or what new advertising strategies need to be undertaken to reach our customers um, who can afford a high-priced product? So they can afford the high-priced product, so what advertising strategies should we use? Well, we know that by what change in advertising uh, timetable, what what strategies we have used and how much money was spent on radio advertising last month and all of the other things that happened from an informational perspective. So we take the information, we turn it into business intelligence when we apply meaning to it and we use it to solve problems and answer questions. So a company might be able to decide, you know, should we continue selling headphones? Actually, I don't think there's any money in headphones these days. <laughs> Maybe there is, I don't know. But, or, um, you know, if we raise the price of this product, what new market should we try to sell it in? Which is actually kind of funny. If we lower the price, what new market should we try to sell it in? Which is like, you know, I always find it funny when you go into Walmart and you see iPads. You go, oh, what's that doing in Walmart? Are you? Now that it's a common day thing, but you see something that's really expensive, like, and then it's in, it's in Walmart. And then you know that there's some sort of, sort of a price break that was done to it because it made it into Walmart somehow. So we're going to start seeing Windows 8 tablets in Walmart <laughs> if they're not there already because they got lowered in price. Which is actually kind of funny. Uh, they're working on the concept of, let's say Microsoft just lowered the price of their tablets, Windows tablets. Well, you, everyone's seen the ad. It says $299 and the, the iPad and the 
windows tablet or side by side and the guy's trying to put I think it does ouch ouch when it tries to zoom out on the screen and you try to put an SD card in it, it says you know you cannot put an SD card here or here or here or here because it doesn't take SD cards it doesn't do two things at once it only does one thing so and then they they take it away and it says two hundred ninety nine dollars see that's a very effective commercial not only am I repeating it but I almost want to go out and buy a, buy a Windows 8. I hate Windows. <laughs> I almost want to go out and buy one of those things because it's only $299 now. <laughs> well, I'll wait until, until I have two, extra $299 I don't know what to do with. Then I'll go over and buy one of those things. But I'm more tempted to actually buy it now. So what does that mean? I'm not a serious Windows user. So then if I work it backwards and I go through this business intelligence, well, I'm not in the database because I don't own a Windows product, so I own the operating system. I have a virtual machine on this computer that has one on here, but and I've worked with Windows before, but I'm not a fan. So it means I'm not in here, but would I be in here now? Possibly, if they lowered the price. If they gave it to me free, I'd be in there. So if I went to Walmart and bought it, I don't know if I'd have the same quality. In my mind, I'm not quite sure if I have the same product quality vision in there. So certain products you don't want to see in Walmart. I didn't like seeing an iPad in Walmart. Because <laughs> then I started thinking, because my vision and my, my as a consumer, my per perception of Walmart is that it's low end, kind of like Kmart. So it's like low income, low end, low quality, low everything, right? iPad, and you have an Apple product, you know, like it's like high quality. What's it doing in Walmart? But people buy them all the time in Walmart, apparently. I had no idea until I was in a Walmart the other day and I saw it. I went, iPads? I didn't even have the iPad mini. They have all the cases and everything for it in Walmart. So. I'm still keeping my iPad, though, <laughs> unless I can get one for less than 209 If the If the Windows tablet goes down to $199, I'm going to buy one. We'll see. <laughs> and I probably can get one on Craigslist for $99, but let's see. All right, relational database model, <coughs> that goes, uh, the, you know what, though? If for a strategic marketing plan and for advertising and for consumer behavior, what I just kind of went off on a tangent on is quite typical. If you're trying to sell a product, you have to understand what the consumer is going to think. What effect are you going to have by putting it in Walmart? What effect are you going to have by lowering a price? You know, are you going to get people who would not normally consider it now start looking at it and go, wow, maybe I should get one of those, um, which actually happens. So, interesting. Um, it's kind of like what happened with the hybrids. Unfortunately, there's a certain class of people that still, I don't, not criticizing anyone who owns a Prius, but there are Prius people and there are not Prius people. <laughs> it's like black and white. There's people that would buy a Prius, and then there's people that would buy any other hybrid on the market except for a Prius. <laughs> and the manufacturers know that, so they keep catering to the Prius buyer. So the Prius still looks the same as it always did. So it's never going to change. It's always going to look like a Prius. It's always going to act like a Prius. It's going to be a Prius because there's a certain segment of the population that buys it, that likes it. So I'll never own a Prius either. I might buy a Honda, but I'm never going to buy a Prius. <laughs> And I'll save that one. I don't want to. I don't want to tell you why. So <laughs> anyway, the relational database model. Uh, the database is the collection of information. So if you've never heard of a database before, it's the collection of information that you organize, <coughs> and you access according to the logical structure of the information. So as I mentioned before, the internet is a huge database. We have databases that are not relational model databases that are still considered databases. Any collection of data that's organized. You know, is the internet really organized? Not so much, but there's a tagging system to it. There's a hierarchy to the data, server to server. But by definition, it would still be considered a database. And a relational database is only one particular type of database. So when you take a class in college on databases, you learn about the relational model. So most people come out with relational databases, and they think, oh, that's the only database they have out there. No, we should have an object or any databases. We have a bunch of other types of databases out there, too. So relational is a series of logically related two-dimensional tables or relations or files for storing information. Your file manager on your computer is a hierarchical database. 
it's a hierarchy structure. It's still a database. Your computer hard drive is actually a database. It's all stored in files and it's all stored in directories. It, it's in some directory regardless of where you put it. So in terms of the relation, the relation equals the table which might equal a file and the most popular database model on the market is the relational model these days. It's considered a second generation. So at a bare minimum, going back to this picture here, you're going to have a database, and the database is going to be housing information. Whatever application creates it doesn't really matter these days. You can still take it, dump the database out, dump the data out of it, reformat it, put it into something else. It's reusable. Or take it as it is and incorporate it into a data warehouse. Or start with an infrastructure with a nice ERP system and format it all together so you have it to work in the future. But and if anything, the characteristics that are associated with this concept is you have the collection of the information. Is there really information? Some might argue. I'd say that should say collection of data or facts, raw facts and figures or data that's stored in a database. Information is derived from a query of the data. You get information like what's the year-to-date sales. I'm going to get that from all the data that's put into the database, like the facts. Like today we made this amount, yesterday we made that amount. And that all accumulation is going to give me that information. Usually there's a logical structure to the data, and we include the logical ties within the information. So also includes the built-in integrity constraints and the table of data that's uh, related for more commonly keys and identifiers. So we use keys to relate the data from different tables with um, identifiers or tags or a way of putting the data together after we separate it all out. Here are some examples of a database. If you've never seen, well, does a database really look like this? No. <laughs> Again, it's not color-coded and it's not like formatted like this, but it should look something and represent it, representative of a table, which is kind of funny because if you had never seen an Excel spreadsheet before, you're not familiar with it, what a table looks like. How do you know that that's really what a database table looks like? like it doesn't look like that. So. It's like you're trying to describe something that doesn't really exist. You know, it's kind of like saying, well, this is what God looks like. Here's a picture. Like, well, I've never seen that picture before. So, so anyway, uh, here's the uh, collection of information. So we got the order file. We got the customer file. We got the employee file. Truck file. Well, file or table, we call it a file or a table. So we take all the data that we want to save, we break it out into different categories, we put it into different buckets, and we save it, and we put it together. So. I don't know where these attendance people are today. <laughs> I know everyone's got, I'm, you know, I'm reading your minds, unless you read mine, I don't know, because I'm like, where, where are they? <laughs> Hold on, let me let me pause this for a second here so I don't say this. <laughs> okay, so to continue where we left off here, databases were created with logical structure. All of them have a logical structure to them. Whether or not they're following a relational model is a different story, but they do have a logical structure. Generally, there is a concept of the data dictionary that goes along with it, and the data dictionary contains all of the logical structure information for the database. So the dictionary is going to have the definition of all the tables, all of the views, indexes, <coughs> objects, anything that might be part of it, um, so that when you enter in data, it's interpreted and used with the data dictionary as a concept as more of a way of separating out the abstraction. So each one of the columns has a data type to it, and the number of columns, the name of the columns, and everything is um, put in there in, tor in terms of uh, its um, ordering system its logical structure, and it abides by the data dictionary, and then the data dictionary holds the information about it. And then it looks like this particular example here creates a truck table, and it specifies three pieces of information about the truck, the date of the purchase, and the field of the date. So the, the field of the date format in this example would be defined by the data dictionary in terms of its structure. Other things that are um, particular for the relational model is the tie between the information. So in terms of a relational model, if we put everything out into relations or tables, then we have to tie the tables together. This is where we get our key constraints from. So we have a primary key, a foreign key that keeps things together. 
<clears throat> if you um, are getting into um, this at level of technology, it's better to take a database class actually and uh, learn the structure of a database and then learn how to actually design tables properly. Um, it will save you a lot of money in consul consultation fees when you have to or, or if you're thinking about hiring someone to put the database together. It's actually not too hard to learn it on your own. It's one of the things a lot of information systems, information technology, and engineering managers end up having to do is uh, if you could just pick up a few skills on how to use a database, how to design one, um, it actually pays off in the end, usually. Um, so the database is the tie, logical ties within the information. So we're looking at, in this particular case, the primary key. <clears throat> and the primary key is going to be a uniquely uh, describes each one of the rows, each one of the records. A record and a row are pretty much the same thing. And then what is a primary in one key ends up being a foreign key in another table. And that's how the linkage is connected. So we have the linkage between the primary and the foreign key that gives us the connection. In this particular case, we have an order file with a customer number. And then we have a customer file with a customer number in it. So some people actually call this, um, it's called uh, controlled redundancy because you're introducing redundancy because you're storing this piece of information twice, which is redundant. But it's controlled because you're doing it through a key system. So it's a good, good form of redundancy. Because generally, the database tries to remove any redundancy. So we only have one address per each customer or one, uh, one of something. Unless we have different orders, and then we have one of each one of the orders, but we don't have duplicate orders in there. So consistency and redundancy are good database characteristics. And here's a graphical picture of the ties between the information, where we have a customer file, a concrete type file, an employee file, and a truck file. And it's all kept together with this order file. And in the order file, we have the primary key, the foreign keys, and all these foreign keys. And it's keeping all of the information together. So it's the, the key system that's doing it. So that's why you take a database class, so you can learn how to design, not only how to break the data out into the different tables, but how to design the key structure so you can tie it all together and not put it back. So, so database has built-in integrity constraints, regardless of whether it's a relational database or an object-oriented one or the internet. There's some sort of integrity constraints system. Which makes it so the integrity constraint by definition is the rules to help ensure the quality of the information. So the quality might be related to its validity, how correct is the information, how current the information might be, and then also maybe um, if there's any redundancy or inconsistencies. So the data dictionary, uh, for example, defines the type of information numeric, date, so on. Foreign keys must be found with primary keys and other um, keys for database <coughs> um, ordering to, uh, excuse me, structure, to structure each one of the tables so that we can put it together. So. so database management systems come in the form of a tool set that's used, and this is the biggest part that a lot of vendors like to do, is they try to sell you the same system all over again. You already own a database system, so here's another one. It's brand new. It's complete. Well, really, the back end's probably the same. It's just the front end that's different. There's not too much variation you can get with a relational model. So Oracle's going to provide you with the same relational or very similar relational features as, let's say, MySQL or um, other databases of the same quality or same type. <coughs> so what you're looking at here is a little picture of a database management system. So by definition, DBMS is more than just the database. It's the software that's controlling the creation of the database tables. So if you look at the little picture here, it's hard to read it probably from where you're sitting, but um, tool packages or user interface um, features to um, change the logical structure, which is what this box says up here. Usually there's a query or some sort of a query optimization technique that's performed. So a query in terms of making changes and also uh, getting information out of the database through data manipulation tools. So you see here the creating and changing the logical structure is directly tied with the data definition. And then underneath here with the data manipulation. So every single database is going to provide you with, I shouldn't say every, but 99.9% of all databases out there are going to provide you with general tool sets. And these general tool sets fall into these categories. Where most systems fall a little bit short <coughs> is going to be in the application generation 
level. So uh, some, um, well, some vendors actually provide tools that work with third-party databases. So for example, you installed Oracle or you installed MySQL. And then you have a plugin, let's say for Visual Basic, or a plugin for Java or something like JDBC. It's a good example, and uh, a driver, a plugin, a module, or something that can be used to provide the connection between the application and the database. So a lot of um, <clears throat> the interesting systems that are built are sharing common components, and so if the common component can be shared among multiple multiple applications, so you're using the same driver interface, or you're using the same database backend, then you can share the information among many different applications. But going back to some of the ERP stuff that I was mentioning before and some of the supply chain management systems, if you have everything stored in a common database, when the customer goes up to purchase the product and the point of sale system captures the, the transaction itself, it can record the transaction in a table and then deduct the item out of an inventory table, which would then trigger maybe, um, <clears throat> I don't know, some sort of a report or some sort of a notification, maybe if it was the last item in inventory. So let's say, for example, the customer comes in and buys the last watch or the last something. There could be an automatic trigger maybe in the database that says, hey, sold the last watch or something, or better yet, it just happens in real time, and then at the end of the day, somebody figures out, oh, maybe we should see what we need to order. So you go and you click on a report, and it tells you how many, perhaps, is in inventory. So, oh, no more watches, or we're down to our last watch or something. And then the entire system could be automated even further by perhaps maybe having another program that goes in and does the report for you, or doesn't even do the report, but automatically figures out, if we set an inventory level at optimal level for watches at three, and we drop below three, automatically order it. So then that gets, um, basically information gets translated into maybe the supply chain management program, or if it's all integrated into one ERP program, that information gets sent to the appropriate module or the appropriate thing to trigger to the supplier, hey, we need more watches. And if we're down to three, we want to have a three all the way up to six. So order, you know, we have four in stock or something, and we set the inventory level at three. Don't order it. So we're now at two, so order so many to go up to a certain point. And so if it's all automated, the entire system can happen without a purchaser or without a buyer having to, or if then anybody going out to the shelves having to count, what do we have in stock? How many watches do we have? So, and if it's all kept together in the database, it's all centrally managed by any application or any number of applications that might be connecting to it. So, long story short, if you're designing a business application these days, you're going to have a database. <laughs> nine, nine, nine times out of ten, about 90% of your systems are going to be having a, some sort of a database back into it. Because you want to share the information. You want the left hand to be talking to the right hand. You want the business intelligence to occur. And obviously, you want to be more efficient. You want to, you know, you don't want someone to go have to go out to actually count how many items you have on a shelf so you can figure out how much you want to order. In the old days, actually, vendors used to go door to door, you know, and they show up, hey, I'm selling my watches, and I'm going to go up to, you know, the Acme watch company or whatever, and they tell you what you, what you want to buy, and they you know, pull out a little book, oh, you need five of these, five of these, they write it all down, right? And then they go back to the office, they put it into the computer system, or they rip the page out of their book, and they hand it to the receptionist or person administrator over at the headquarters. She puts the order in or he puts the order in and then like a week later the watches show up. Now there's a, you know, fulfillment that can be done like same day. You know, and it can be done automatically. Oh, we sold the same watch and then by the end of the day the new watches show up. Well, where'd they come from? Because the moment that we ran down below a certain inventory level, it automatically triggered to the supplier that we needed them. Everything was done electronically and then everything was scheduled accordingly, and then all of a sudden the truck shows up, and here's your watches. And the day's not even done yet, so which is actually kind of cool. Um, but that's highly streamlined. Now, if you're a small mom and pop shop, you're not going to be able to afford that technology. But if you're um, a Target store, you probably could afford it. Or if you're a you know a bigger chain, you have something like that already in place. Because you're not going to keep inventory. It's too expensive. <laughs> so but you're, you're not going to hire people to go count stuff on shelves. That's too expensive. So 
it's actually very expensive to even have them sell the items to the customer. Which, you know, now you see in the grocery store, you check yourself out. <laughs> That's great automation, you know. I'm learning how to be a cashier by scanning my items over the sensor and then putting them in my own bag and then pressing a button. Okay, I'm done. And I started thinking about that. <clears throat> isn't what isn't that what our customer service people do? So how come I'm not getting paid when I check myself out at the grocery store? You can do it all the time. It's just like no one ever pays me to do that. But they're paying somebody else to do that. So I'm thinking we should get a discount or something. We go through the line. We should get like a dollar or something. I don't know. They should give us something. <coughs> so, but they don't. And we're saving them money. So, and there's a lot of people that won't go through that system only because they don't want to hassle with it. Because you could stand there, put all your items on the thing, just stand there and check, test, text message or talk on the phone or do something. Hey, can you ring this up for me? It's kind of like pumping your own gas, you know? <laughs> well, that took years for people to figure out, oh, do we have to pump our own gas? Because no, you can't get your gas. Not in the state of California. You can elsewhere, though. Yeah, other, other, other states you can drive up. You sit in your car, they pump your gas for you. And I'm thinking, why am I pumping my own gas? So, well, they do they charge you anything? I don't know. No, oh, same price. Yeah, remember you used to say self service and it was full service. There's no more full service. So I have suspicion in the grocery stores, they're not going to pay people to ring us up anymore. We got to ring ourselves up. So anyway, slight tangent, but back to databases here. Uh, so let's see. It helps us specify the order, the logical structure. Also gives us a tagging system so we know what we have. The worst thing possible is when you throw a bunch of stuff, raw facts and figures out, and you put them in a big old bucket or a box or something, or actually just look at your desks, you know, if you're not very organized. I have all my papers in a big old pile, and then later I go, where is that document? Where'd it go? And I gotta go through all the papers to find it. So the other thing, also good for business sense and business intelligence, put it all out into different folders different tables. We know that these are sales numbers and they're not returns. We know that this is the cost and not the you know not the sale price or something. So if we put a proper label on it and give it uh, some sort of an ordering system and a structure, then further down the road we can figure out what it is and then how to use it. So all right, so five components of a database management system. Um, every single database is going to have an engine. It's going to have some sort of a management system associated with it, tagging system structure to it. We're going to have a, de a definition system, some sort of a data dictionary. We're going to have some sort of a manipulation system or a query engine or a query system. Um, and if you've taken a database class before, you know that everything is manipulated through SQL. Structured Query Language. So, when you take a database class, you learn about how to build the databases, how to structure the tables, how to run queries. In fact, you spend most of your time trying to figure out how to run queries and structure tables and design them. And if you take my database class, you learn about entity relationship diagramming, <laughs> which is the methodology I use. It's just one methodology. There's many other different ways of designing, well I shouldn't say many, there's a couple of different options but not too many these days. Entity relationship modeling works quite well for relational databases. It doesn't work as well as object oriented modeling would for object oriented databases. So it depends on the type of model. It, the type of model that you're going to use is going to depend on, on the type of database that you're building, long story short. So that's what you learn in a database class, and uh, also data administration and stuff like that. So Here's a blown up picture of that small little screen you couldn't see a few minutes ago. That one might actually look a little bit more visible to you. And uh, this one here is just nothing more than giving a sort of a summary or a big picture look. Not that you could take and actually look at a database, but if you were to look at a database, it might look something like that, who knows, uh, where we have application generators and data administration. And these, you might think of these as different modules, things. So here's what ends up happening when you switch over to the ERP system and you have a customer relationship management system already, and you have a supply chain management system already, and you have a point of sale system already. Now you got one, two, three, five different databases, which is where most of the complication going back to what I was just saying originally when I started the lecture for today. 
half the problem with those ERP systems is getting all the data into it <laughs> and getting all the business transitioning, you know, getting all the business processes to change so you're working with that system. Because what ends up happening for the most part, if you're a small company, you're not going to go out and buy a two or $300,000 ERP system. Instead, you're going to buy a small point of sale system. You're going to buy a small supply chain management system, maybe. Who knows what you're going to get. Um, you're going to do it manually. You're going to have the data. You're going to have the database all over the place. And we're going to have different databases. So that's a lot of work. Not to say it's not worth the effort, but there's a transitional time cost. And plus, there's always that fear you're going to lose some of the data. All your sales are over here. And there's a risk. Yeah, do you want to risk losing all that information you have? Because this database is a separate island of its own, and you have another one that's run with another application, and uh, another one with a different application, which is kind of interesting because nowadays, multiple vendors and multiple software developers are starting to realize that people want the data all together. <laughs> so if you already have this system, and you buy this other system from the same vendor, it works with the same database. So you don't have two installs of the same database system. You only have one, hopefully. And then you have the ability to share the information among multiple different applications, because what you really want to do is share that information. The information sharing is going to give you the ability to do the data warehousing, and also the ability to do the data mining and the, the query searching, stuff like that. So, All right, not to bore you any you know, too much with the database management system concepts, because some of you, well, the interesting thing is some of you guys are business people, some of you are engineering people, some of you are healthcare science people, <laughs> you're all taking engineering management. Some people know all this stuff already. Actually, some people might even be in my Oracle class, or have taken a database class before. Uh, so I'm going off of the assumption that nobody has a background in anything, so I can at least, at least, um, hopefully for business people, not have to, and then not have to not have to be too technical. At the same point, if you know this stuff, it's really boring. So I'm going to skip through some of it. Uh, so the engine, physical view, logical view. We have different perspectives that we can view of this. So here's that picture again. So. In the data definition subsystem, we could be looking at anything, actually. A subsystem that specifies field names, data types, forms, values. Could be of any type of system. So it helps create and maintain the data dictionary and structure itself. So. The data manipulation system is kind of interesting. Everything has gone SQL, but in the old days we actually had different types. In fact, Microsoft Access has a different manipulation system. You never have to write an SQL query at all, but you can put information in and you can get information out. Well, you're using, you know, something that looks like Excel actually. You type it in, you're typing it in as if it were a spreadsheet, and then you can sort the columns and you can do wizards to actually do the queries for you, stuff like that. That would be called the manipulation system. There's no law that says it has to be SQL, actually. So a lot of higher end products will have a SQL, well, it's a shell on the SQL. It's a higher level implementation, a button you press that says, give me all the year to date sales. And it's just running the query. So then we have products like, um, I don't know if Crystal Reports is still on the market, but that was a really good one. It is? Oh, yeah. That did, uh, I liked uh, Crystal Reports, actually, originally, because it's, it's uh, fairly full-functioning, you know, and uh, you can make up and can design your own report. So you just press a button, it runs it out, and it gets the data fresh. You run the queries for you fresh, and the, the data doesn't get stale. problem with, support, uh, with uh, reports and queries is that the data is stale five minutes after you run it. Unless you're working on a system that's not live, your data is constantly changing. So you don't want reports. So you put it online, which is the you know the common theme these days, and it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It is always up to date. So it just constantly like maybe refreshes like every you know five minutes or ten minutes or something. Stats. So I'm sorry. Stats. Stats. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know what? A lot of uh, stock market systems do that. Weather systems do that. Um, 
you know, it's it's uh, it's going to automatically update it for you, which is good. So that's what, what you essentially need if you're going to use an, any type of reporting system these days. Um, so there's a primary interface to it. There's also this concept of the view to think about. It allows you to see contents of the database file, make changes, query, find information. And uh, you get, uh, this is a Microsoft Access screenshot, by the way. And uh, when you use the view mechanism, you're seeing a subset of the data. In other systems, you would run a query to create a view, perhaps. You can query a view. You can look at the view. So, Report generators, you know, <laughs> buttons, clicks, wizards, and stuff to get reports out of that and stuff. Uh, query by example tools. This is another Microsoft screenshot. Actually, to think about it, Microsoft Access does support a lot of traditional relational database concepts. Yeah, it does both. Yeah. Um, it has limitations, however, because everything's stored in a file. So it has operating system limitations because the file can only get to be such one size. I mean, there's a maximum size on that file, which is limiting if you're going to make like a huge, if you're like a target store, you can't use access for that. <laughs> Too many transactions, it's not, it's going to fill up the file. And then you got to go multiple files if that's the case. So here's our structured query language, SQL. It's a standard fourth generation language. It's not really a language, it's a query. Uh, so the query language is not a programming language, it's a query language. Not a scripting language either. So it performs a uh, query, query capabilities and query tools. Used by IT people. Here's some examples. I'll select some fields from a table where a GPA is less than or equal to something and something else. So. Application generation systems, this is what you get for most of the ITIS people will work with an application generator system that will work with sometimes pre-compiled modules and systems that are part of other systems. So you get this fancy point of sale system and then you have an interface to it so you can create your own reports from it or you can create your own input into it or maybe um, an add-on module or create your own add-on module, which is actually kind of the current trend. So why reinvent the wheel when you can create your own from something that's pre-given to you, uh, which is actually a nice way of doing it. Mostly IT professionals, not real programmers, information systems, information technology people will use those things. In terms of the database administration subsystem, we're normally looking at backup recovery security features and stuff like that. So. I'm not going to go through this. In fact, what I will do is leave this for you. It is the information technology lecture number six, and I'm starting with a 30 through 40. It's about 18 slides of everything you ever wanted to know. Well, not everything, but a glimpse at database management features. But I'm sensing that most of you probably already have some sort of a background in databases. So it's kind of rudimentary. You may not have ever heard of the word crude before. Probably you have. Create, uh, read, update, delete. You know. Query optimization, reorganization, security management, stuff like that. Database administration systems. So You may not be as familiar with data warehousing and data mining as a concept unless you've taken a class in this particular area. Most people who work in Silicon Valley are familiar with databases, I think, for the most part. So data mining, though, maybe not so much, but it is becoming a household <coughs> word. So it helps you keep and create. So business, business intelligence is created not from usually the database, but from the warehouse and the mining capabilities. And the database is not normally just one database. It's multiple databases that go into the warehouse, multiple that go into the mining. So the warehouse, by definition, is the collection of information that supports business analysis activities and decision making. So in a warehouse, usually they call them data cubes or data components. You might have an Oracle database, a MySQL database, internet information, a hierarchical database, object-oriented. You have all this stuff that goes into it. And the warehouse can tell you snapshot information and um, let me guess, um, let me, uh, let me uh, descri describe it. Without having to do a query, it'll give you summary information. So if it's a commonly, commonly created kind of um, data gathering technique, it'll give you sheets of here's all the sales numbers, here's all of this, here's all of that. So you're not doing a low-level 
query on the individual pieces or raw facts and figures in there. Instead, you're working on the summary or the snapshot or year-to-year -year analysis from huge accumulations of data. So it's like taking a year's worth of sales data along with a year's worth of economic data from, let's say, um, the U.S. Census Bureau and a year's worth of information from this other company that did market research on something. And then taking all that information and putting it all together and doing a query on the analysis between all these different components. That's what the warehouse is good for. And it also allows you to store big data. I mean, it's, it's a big data concept from the beginning. Uh, big data, however, is a different concept these days. I think I choose teaching a course called Big Data, I believe, next term perhaps. Uh, but it gets more on the lines of a cross between data warehousing, data mining, with what happens when the database gets so big that you can't query it anymore. In fact, a lot of databases out there you can't query. If you were to query the database, it's going to take you two hours to come back with a search result. <laughs> and you can't put that into a web engine. How are you going to use it? So the more data we can accumulate, the more warehouses we build, we're getting a, another step higher than that. we got to get higher than that. So we've got to use different tools. We can't use traditional query tools to query that data anymore. So we have to use different techniques and we have to use different optimization to make the data actually available for searching or for navigating or looking at. So those concepts are getting into a higher dimension of usefulness and tools that are associated with working with huge databases and huge groupings of databases together. So um, I'm not quite sure who's going to teach that course. I think they hired a new guy, actually. So it'll be interesting. I might actually sit in on that class. I, and I was Dr. Rill in the back for a few minutes there. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to sit in on the big data class, I think, actually, and kind of see what's going on with that. Uh, interesting thing, it's kind of like cloud computing when cloud computing first came out. Um, in fact, we still have a lot of inconsistencies. Not only do we have inconsistencies in the definition of what is cloud computing, but also in the technologies, there's a lot of variants. You can't just say that there's one type of cloud and there's one type of computing platform for that. It's like multiple, multiple dimensioned. Well, so is big data. So how he's going to do it, I'm, I'm kind of curious what approach he's going to take from a teaching perspective. Like, how are you going to explain big data? How are you gonna, what are you going to do in that class? <laughs> so I'll be curious to see that as well. Data warehouse characteristics, it's multidimensional. We have rows and columns and layers. It supports decision making, not transaction processing. So not like a database. And contains summaries of information, not every single piece of detail. Can you get down to the detail? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Depends on the warehouse configuration for the most part. We have data mining tools. So that's software tools that let you query the information in the data warehouse. Because data mining needs to be done on a large amount of data. Itsy bitsy little pieces of data like what's going to be in one database, not going to tell you much which is why um, it's nice that, uh, to have multiple sources. So in here we have uh, a data warehouse as in a database system itself is responsible for converting the logical requests into physical environments. So that's going to work with the data warehouse actual data. And then the data miner as a tool set is going to have intelligent agents that's incorporated with query and reporting tools, multidimensional analysis, statistical tools and things that all work together. So, in terms of the query and the reporting tools, similar to query uh, tools that you see in a normal database or a typical database environment, SQL report generators. Now, again, it depends on what database, excuse me, data mining tool set you're working with. Some actually work with their own data sets, so you have your own data format. Some actually work with databases. Some actually work with uh, hierarchical or structured data that's non-tagged. So it depends on the type of data that you're working with in terms of what type of tool you're going to work with. Most of the open source tools are working with text data. So you'd have to take whatever was in the database, export it out in some sort of a delimited text format, and then run it through the data mining tool. And it's going to tell you something regarding what you know, what characteristics it can possibly tell you, depending upon what you're looking for, with what types of variants. So it's a lot of them are also statistical based as well. 
Um, so we have intelligent agents that analyze the AI tools that help you discover information and trends. And then we have multidimensional analysis, slice and dice techniques for viewing multidimensional information, and statistical tools as well. Data marts. It's kind of like the, uh, the marts, the supermarkets, the data marts. Subsets of data mart warehouses in which only focus on portions of data warehouse information, on, on portions of the information that's kept in the data warehouse. What do we have in this data mart? Well, they're smaller. They're marked. Marks. Marts. Markets. Blech. Merchandising, advertising, distribution, sales. What's all this coming out of? Maybe this is out of an accumulation of all the Target stores. That would make sense. Or maybe this is out of an accumulation of Walmart, Target, and Kmart or something. Or maybe this is census information. Or maybe we don't know where this stuff came from. We could know. Actually, we should know. But it could be a combination. And we separate it out into little data marks that are subsets. So all we want to know about is sales information. Then we go, do we have one that says sales on it? Here's sales down here. And all we want to know is about market segment or merchandising. And then we get all of the subsets that come out of it. It's, not, it's called a data mart. So. so some considerations for data warehouses. Do you really need one? Hmm. Or does your database environment support all of your functions? It might, actually. So you need a data warehouse when you don't have the internal capabilities sometimes. And you can get outsourced warehouse access for accumulated data. Actually, you can buy data. Even consumers can buy data on the internet. It's actually pretty easy. Um, if you're doing an AI research project, you can buy thousands and thousands of data sets already given for you that you can do data mining on and stuff. What is it? It's going to be medical records from this a VA hospital from this date to this date or something. Or it's going to be usually categorized as something. So you know what you're buying <laughs> and what are you buying that stuff for? Because someone did the research. Someone did a survey. Someone did something and they market it. They sell it. We sell it. Why not? Um, so you not, may not necessarily have to spend years accumulating your own information. Actually, drug companies do it all the time. They take a 10-year study of everyone who's taken this Advil and they have the 10-year study of everyone who's taken that drug over there and that drug over there. You put it all together to see what side effects might people see and stuff. And then you can take the side effects of every people, all these people who have taken Advil, cross it with these people who did something else, and then you can see the correlation. 10% of the people, what did they say for women, I guess, 10% of... A good percentage of women who have smoked for 15 or longer years end up with breast cancer or something like that. I don't know. From all the statistics here, all the statistics, there's a statistical-based analysis, but they cross the data together. You buy the data. You're, it's for sale. <laughs> so it depends. you have to know where to look for it. A lot of artificial intelligence companies or researchers will buy data sets. It's called a data set. You buy it. Gives you, usually it's in an ASCII form on a disk, a DVD or something, and you load it up into your database. You convert it, put it into the format that you're going to need it for. Uh, you may not necessarily need a database. You could turn it into a database. Uh, you could turn it into a data warehouse. You can do anything you want with it. Do all employees need a big data warehouse or a small data mart? They may not need anything at all. And how up to date must the information be? If it's a data warehouse, Data Mart, it may not necessarily need to be up to date. Um, for correlation statistics, does it really matter if the data was collected 10 years ago or if it was collected one year ago? If it's relationship between people who walk barefoot and, oh no, people who don't wear sunscreen, <laughs> the likelihood of them developing skin cancer. Does it matter if we did that study in the 1950s or if we did that study in the 1980s? I guess it would matter if the sun intensity changed, I guess. But some, some of it matters, some of it doesn't matter, I guess. So. I don't know. I think all the smoking stuff is pretty relevant from the 1950s, which is where we're getting most of our data from. They stopped tracking people. Once they figured out that there was a linkage between smoking and cancer, then they went, oh, let's stop tracking this. <laughs> because then the drug company, uh, the, the cigarette companies are, might be held responsible. And they don't want to be held responsible. So why do we want to know that? Why do we why do we want to know that there's a linkage or not a linkage? But there is a linkage, but I don't know what I seriously you're not gonna get a you're not gonna get a well, I shouldn't say that probably will happen. 
was this the class I did the earthquake position the, the prediction? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I forget that. Uh, well, maybe one of these days very soon they won't be selling cigarettes anymore. I've noticed people don't smoke anymore, which is good. So uh, I'll shut up about that. Okay, what data mining tools do you need? Or depends on what you're doing. It's all about business intelligence. So business intelligence revisited. Um, I am actually going to finish this today. Uh, we have a collective information about customers, competitors, business partners, competitive environments, and your internal operations of making important, effective, and strategic business decisions. That's what business intelligence really is about. Hot topics in business today. Current market is $50 billion in double digits annual growth of business intelligence. So everyone wants to put business intelligence systems, you know, whatever. What does that mean? It's intelligent. So. The objectives are to help people understand the capabilities of their organization. So if you're intelligent about your sales, your customers, your product line, your state of the art, your trends, your future, then hopefully as a business manager, you're going to make better decisions, theoretically. So you say it's a business intelligence system. It means what? You know, flip a coin. You know, it's better than flip a coin, I guess. It's it's better than, you know, giving you information in terms of technological, geographical, economic information as well. It depends on the type of business that you're working with and the objectives, um, whether you're profit, nonprofit, what it, your focus is on, are you, you're, are you worried about your competitors, are you making cutting edge, first to market kind of products, in terms of what level of business intelligence you're working with. Does a university need business intelligence? Hmm, depends on how cutting edge they are, I guess. If they're a brick, does a business? Uh, I'll ask him in the back. Does a does a university need business intelligence? Mm -hmm. I'm asking you a question. Does a university need business intelligence? Does the university need business intelligence? Yeah. Uh, if the university intends to stay in business. Yeah, I think it does. <laughs> Everybody needs business intelligence. Point being that it it it, it does applies to. Well, this is an engineering management class in which we're overviewing today the concept of business intelligence as it relates to tools that are for like data mining, data warehouses, databases. And so I, w I was basically kind of thinking about it myself, thinking, well, if a unit, does every business need business intelligence? It, to some extent, I think that's actually kind of true, actually. Because if you think about it, if you want to be competitive, Unless, unless you actually have a strong customer base that is yours guaranteed. Like the government doesn't need business intelligence. In fact, they can run any department they want any way they want. We can have a line for an hour and a half at a DMV, and customers will still go to the DMV. <laughs> <laughs> so how intelligent do you need to be with that? Yeah? Since you, since you actually told me now. Yeah. Oh. I need to see you before you leave. Okay. Well, we're going to end probably momentarily within the next 15 minutes. But I have a meeting tonight, the DPC tonight. So I'll look for you. I won't go without talking to you. Okay. I don't know. These are all engineering management. This is a cross between business. Do you guys know who this guy is? <laughs> Can they pause this sucker? <laughs> I'm recording this. On that note, let's finish up. Get get out of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So I just have a couple of concluding slides. To, we're not done yet. I have a couple. Of I want to get rid of. This, I want to get done with this. I just to get rid of. Get done with this lecture by the end of the day here. Um. So I was talking about business intelligence in terms of the objective. It is to uh, basically it's based on what the company needs to accomplish. <laughs> and so if we look at this little picture here, we have the internal information, the external information that all goes into this concept of this business intelligence that we're going to use um, to solve problems and hopefully invent new products and things of that nature. It all goes into this, also this goes into this concept called the digital dashboard. Digital dashboards are very common these days. They're in consumer products as well as in business products. So most of your business intelligent applications and your systems, especially management systems for databases and warehouses and data mining, have this dashboard. In fact, if you think about the smartphones these days, they're all dashboard oriented. 
you oh look at the phone and it's got buttons on it. So it's the widgets, the buttons, the items on it that allow you to quickly get it information that allow you to use the smart device a little bit more efficiently. A lot of operating systems have switched to the dashboard concept. Um, so unlike uh, your cell phone or your smartphone, business dashboards normally have more charts and graphics on it because you want to see how are the sales going, how are, what's, what's happening with the returns, how's the manufacturing progressing. So you can see bar charts and uh, graphs and things that will help you um, display information at a glance. So displays the key information gathered from several different sources in a format that's tailored that, you know, needs the wants of the individuals that are using it. So we also have this concept of information ownership in terms of information being a resource. It must be managed and organized, and uh, it may also have uh, some sort of an ownership associated with it. It can be bought and sold, as I was mentioning before. So you also have to need to consider the strategic management support, <coughs> the sharing and the responsibility, and then the information cleanliness. Information cleanliness is also an interesting topic because um, we always think about cleaning or scrubbing the database or scrubbing the data, which means we're getting rid of the pieces of information that aren't appropriate or that were misentered or that are wrong or invalid. And uh, in, a, in that sense, we could actually clean a database to change its content, which may not necessarily be a good thing either. So in research, generally, um, if you're doing a research study, you don't want, you don't, you want clean data, but you don't want it too clean, because then you're going to get rid of things that might actually, from a data mining perspective, might actually give you some information. Um, so abnor abnormalities or, or differences in the data if they're proper differences, <clears throat> might actually be important information. And if you clean them all out, you're not going to see the variances. You're not going to see the trends. You may not necessarily notice something. There's also strategic management support that goes along with the database administration and the data mining activities. And it's covered in uh, C-level positions. Well, we, are, we're, we haven't covered that lecture yet, uh, but it is covered with uh, different we, we hit some of the strategic management support functions in the organization that it is will be covered in a future lecture coming up. But in terms of the database administration and the data administration, we're looking at the plans and overseeing the development and monitoring the information resources that are coming out of that database. So <clears throat> it's nothing to keep data unless you share it. It doesn't have a meaning to it unless it's applied and whether it's shared or simulating. So sharing the information is important. Everyone can share while not consuming information. But someone must own it in accepting responsibility for the quality and the accuracy of it. So census data is owned by the government, and they're collecting it, and it's supposed to be accurate up to their standards. But they share it. You can actually buy census information <clears throat> so you know what the average income is <clears throat> for a particular neighborhood, so you know that you want to put your store there or you know information about your customer base or you know information about the market or about the economy. And a note on the information cleanliness related to the ownership and the responsibility. By cleanliness we're talking about no duplicates in the information and no redundant records um, such as uh, spelling of the customer's name incorrectly. Those would be things that we'd want to clean out. Abnormalities or variances, we probably want to leave those in. But to clean it from a particular accuracy point of view, <clears throat> getting rid of problems, and we have the garbage in, garbage out scenario for decision making to kind of consider as well. So we've had an interesting day today, and I will leave it at that. And uh, next week we'll move on to another topic, but we are all done for today. So thank you for showing. See you next week. Thank you.